the neural layer ends at the margin of the retina called the ora serrata. The pigmented layer continues on the surface of the serial body and it continues on the surface of the iris. Blood supply of the retina. You can enlarge these pictures to see. I put them very, very small, but you can enlarge them. The two most important circulations are a plexus of blood vessels on the outer surface, which is called the choriocapillaries. They supply the outer one third of the retina. And the neural layer is supplied by the central retinal artery, which is a branch of the ophthalmic artery. This is a branch of the ophthalmic artery. The ophthalmic artery gives rise to the central retinal artery. I'm going to tell more about it. I'm just naming them. Venous drainage. The central retinal vein drains into the superior and inferior ophthalmic vein which drains into the cavernous sinus. So these are the few nuts and bores, layers of the retina. If you look up your board review book, it will tell you 10 layers. You say, oh my God, have to memorize these 10 layers? No, you don't have to. We will make it simple. Basically, we will condense them into three most important layers. What are the three most important layers? Going from outer to inner. This is the retina. This is the vitreous humor. That means the light is coming from here. The cornea is here. Are we clear? The retina. The choroid is here. And the sclera is outside. So this is the outer surface. This is the posterior and that's the anterior. Are we clear about the orientation? So going from outer to inner, we have three layers of neurons. I'm just condensing the, all the layers. An outer nuclear layer. Inner nuclear layer and a ganglion cell layer, ganglion layer. These are the three most important layers for us. Outer nuclear layer is composed of the layer is also called the layer of rods and cones. Actually, it's called outer nuclear layer because of the nuclei of the rods and cones. The inner nuclear layer is composed of bipolar neurons, and the ganglion layer is the final layer with axons of which constitute the optic nerve. Are we clear? Where the outer nuclear layer and the inner nuclear layer synapse, this layer is called, this layer of synapse is called the outer plexiform layer. The word plexiform means layer of synapses. And where the inner nuclear layer synapses with the ganglion cell layer, that is called the inner plexiform layer. Now I need you to know something. There are many things which are in this picture. In fact, one picture can tell more stories than a thousand words, like they say. The retina starts, the pigment, the, the, the neural layer of the retina starts from here onwards. But this is also a part of the retina. Remember I told you retina has got two layers, a neural layer and a pigmented layer. This is the pigmented layer of the retina. Can you see? This pigmented layer of the retina gets pigment from the choroid layer. This interface between the pigmented layer and the neural layer, this interface I'm saying interface because in actual life, there is no layer of separation. However, you will see in embryology, I'm going to tell you, the pigmented layer is derived from a different source, and the neural layer is derived from a different source. So there is a potential space between these two layers. And what is the significance of that potential space? Wonderful. If you get a blunt trauma, retinal detachment occurs, it occurs between the neural layer and the pigmented layer. Contrary to what we may think, retinal detachment does not mean the retina is not getting detached from the choroid. Retinal detachment means the neural layer separates from the pigmented layer. The pigmented layer gets stuck, remains stuck to the choroid, the neural layer separates. And I've seen a case like that. This happened, this guy, he was participating in a rally, you know, going on the street and shouting slogans and all the rest of it. So the police fired water cannon at the, to disperse the crowd. And the water cannon, as you know, the water has got a very strong blast. So the blast of water hit him in the eye. It so happened that he was in the front. Next day, he came to the clinic, saying the difficulty of vision. And when we did an ophthalmoscopy, we found that he had undergone retinal detachment. So retinal detachment can occur from a blunt trauma to orbit, and it occurs in between these two layers, between the pigment layer and the. To continue. 
quick few quick word about the cells. Rods and cones. These are the first order neurons in the outer nuclear layer. Rods are called rods because they are triangular rectangular shaped. Cones are called cones because they are. These are the ones which are the photosensitive receptors. They contain the photoreceptors. They are the ones which is called the electromagnetic radiation, the physical part of the spectrum. They use glutamate as a neurotransmitter. Next, the bipolar neurons. Nothing special. I told you that all the special senses have bipolar neurons. Remember? We've already mentioned that. So they have got a peripheral process and a central process. The peripheral process synapses with the layer of rods and bones. The central process synapses with the ganglion cell layer. They also use glutamate as a neurotransmitter. Next, the ganglion cell layer. They also use glutamate and their central, their peripheral process synapses with the central process of the rod ganglion cell, uh, bipolar neurons, and the central process continues, collects together, and forms the optic nerve, which we shall see in the next chapter. The next slide. There are two, three other types of cells which I'll briefly mention. Connecting adjacent layers of rods and cones situated on the outer plexiform layer are small, small cells, are small, small neurons. They are called horizontal cells. What do they do? They use GABA as their neurotransmitter. They are inhibitory interruption neurons. And their job is to prevent excessive stimulus from coming through the rods and cones. So they exert lateral inhibition to the rods and cones. So that excessive impulses do not reach the ganglion cell. Are these different from the cajol, horizontal cajol? Yeah, yeah, it's totally different. Because horizontal cells are not present only in the cortex. These are just called horizontal cells because they exert lateral inhibition. There's another similar type of cell which are located in the inner plexiform layer. What do these do? They receive impulses from the inner nuclear layer, layer of bipolar neurons, and they in turn send inhibitory impulses to the ganglion cells. And they also use GABA and glutamate, sorry, GABA and glycine as their neurotransmitter. They also prevent excessive impulses from reaching the ganglion cells. So these are the two inhibitory interventional neurons which are located in the region of horizontal cells and the amacrine cells. And finally, there is a non-neural cell which is called the radial cells of Mueller. These red ones that you see here, these are something similar to glia. They are called the radial cells of Mueller, or radial Mueller cells, which go the full thickness of the retina, and they produce what is known as the outer limiting membrane and an inner limiting membrane. Just like the astrocytes give food processes and form an outer limiting membrane of the brain and an inner limiting membrane of the brain. Similarly, the glial cells here also, they produce an outer limiting membrane and an inner limiting membrane. They are non-neural cells. Their job is more supportive. So these are some few other cells of the retina. There are a few special words. I'll just quickly summarize them. The optic nerve gets myelinated by oligodendrocytes. After it is penetrated through the sclera, so long as it is within the sclera, it does not undergo myelination. Once it has penetrated through the sclera, then it undergoes myelination. Why is oligodendrocyte involved in the myelination? Why not one cell? Because it is the central nervous system tract, exactly. So that's an important point to remember. Oligodendrocyte is the one which is responsible for myelination. So you only guess something. Can you tell me what you guessed? Remember when we talked about multiple sclerosis, we said it is a demyelination of central nervous system tract. So optic nerve is one of the structures which is predominantly affected in multiple sclerosis, the point I want you to remember. Because oligodendrocyte myelination is destroyed in multiple sclerosis. And because this is the central nervous system, this is the prime site of demyelination in multiple sclerosis also. <coughs> Tight junctions, etc. etc. A few quick words about the rods and cones. Rods outnumber cones by several times. Uh, it's not written here but I have written it in my slide. Location. Rods are more common in the peripheral parts of the retina. Cones are more frequent in the macular region and the fovea centralis. 
Rods are more sensitive, so therefore they respond to dim light. They are for scores of pictures. Cones are more for acute vision and they work better in bright light. That's why when you see something very closely, you see to the center of your eye, you see with your macula and your cones come into action. Cones are for color vision. That's why it is also called photopic vision. Rods are for scotopic vision or dim light vision. Rhodes are play, play a role, they have a pigment called rhodopsin. Cones have a pigment called photopsin and iodopsin. You don't have to know the details, these are all <coughs> complex molecules, all derived from red. Rhodes require vitamin A for their regeneration and they are responsible for dark adaptation. Let me give you an example. When you enter a cinema hall, late, when the movie has already started, what happens? You cannot see your way, isn't it? Because you are from outside, you came from outside, your eyes are already the bright light has photo bleached the rhodopsin. It takes about 20 minutes for the rhodopsin to regenerate. So that is the period of what is known as dark adaptation. Let me give you a story, an interesting story. During the Second World War, the Royal Air Force pilots, they had to take off and, I mean, they used to be on duty all the time because there was a war going on, right? So they had to take off at a moment's notice, even in the night or any time. And those days, they didn't have all those laser sights and all those things like we have today, laser guided missiles and all. They had to do everything by vision. And everything is dark. So even the few minutes it takes for them to be dark adapted was very dangerous. I mean, they can be shot down, especially when they're on a bombing raid in Germany or something. In order to keep their eyes dark adapted throughout, they used to be asked to wear red glasses. So if you wear red glasses, your eyes will be dark adapted. So therefore, they won't have to wait for the eyes to get adapted. So this is just a practical example of dark adaptation. And we will see later on that the rods are responsible for the vision, which we had mentioned earlier in the cortex chapter, the magnocellular stasis. And the, the cones are responsible for the barbocellular blob system. Remember what is the function of the barbocellular blob system? Color and this thing, visual patterns and face recognition. The magnocellular stripe system was responsible for motion, depth, and spatial perception. So rods and cones will play a role now. Yes? So Ms. Hayes, I think you told this story of this cat here about um, a young child from Asia in Thailand. Mm -hmm. And he has like really aqua blue eyes, which is not normal. Because what eyes? Like aqua blue eyes, because okay. he has night vision. Yeah. Yeah. He has night vision. Yeah. He's in China? Maybe because he's got the excess pigmentation. So what happens is it keeps your eye constantly dark adapted. I just wear sunglasses. Uh, no, they found that it works better in keeping the eyes better dark adapted. Sunglasses actually just filter out the ultraviolet radiation and they filter out the intensity of the light. But it does not really, really keep your eyes dark adapted. But red glasses was to used to keep the dark. Especially if you read a book called The Dam Busters, there's a movie also. Dam Busters. They were specially trained pilots who were supposed to fly very low and actually blow out a dam in Germany and they had to do it by vision. They had to fly just 60 feet above. And they were especially kept dark adapted throughout during the training process because they had to do it in the night. So all these things are mentioned there. You know, and they did it. They blew out the dam and knocked out Germany. Okay, so a few clinical correlations are mentioned here. Night blindness is due to vitamin A deficiency, deficiency, and that is called nyctalopia. It can be due to many other conditions also. And there are some situations, genetic conditions where there is genetic deficiency of the cones, and that is called day blindness or hemoglobia. Okay. Retinal physiology, you can read up on your own. Just the point to remember is, the brighter the light, less will be the neurotransmitter released, contrary to what we may think. The light, brighter the light, less will be there. Because bright light causes hyperpolarization. It closes the sodium channels. So therefore, constant efflux of potassium will lead to hyperpolarization. So less light, more neurotransmitter, and vice versa. The mechanism is very complex. We are not expected to go into the details. In fact, if you were to read up 
It's very complex how vitamin A is used, but the net result is less light, more neurotransmitter, and vice versa. And the process of conversion of electromagnetic energy to the chemical energy is called retinal transduction. And this also requires vitamin A, retinol. Now let's come to a few important points about the retina itself. The word fundus means the ophthalmic, ophthalmoscopic appearance of the retina. In your anatomy, you have heard the word fundus, isn't it? How many fundus do you know? I'm trying to arrive at a point. How many fundus do you know? You should be able to tell me at least three fundus from your anatomy. Yes, good. Stomach. Fundus of the stomach. Second? Ah, come on, come on, come on. Oh, pancreas. Kidney. Kidney fundus. <laughs> You're really, really just thinking me out. What about the fundus of the uterus? What about the fundus of the gallbladder? You are supposed to teach me all these things. I'm not supposed to teach you all that thing. Okay, why are they called fundus? What's the, the, that means there must be a common meaning for the word fundus, yes or no? No, fundus actually means the most distal or the dependent part when you approach it from one particular direction. So in the uterus, you approach it from the cervix, isn't it? So the most distal is the fundus. Stomach, when they first examined it, they saw it from the pyloric end. So the most distal part was the fundus, which is under the, under the dome of the diaphragm. Gallbladder, you see it from the cystic duct side. So therefore, the position below the liver is the fundus of the gallbladder. Here also, why is this called the fundus? Because you are looking at the eye from the iris, or from the pupil. So the, for the most dependent part is the retina. That's why this is called the fundus. Fundus of the eye. Fundoscopic appearance, or ophthalmoscopic appearance. Okay, this is, so this is the meaning of the word, just so that you understand why it is called the fundus. What are the landmarks? These are you want you have to know because we are going to mention all these things again in your FCM. But you are going to be asked these questions. Normal appearance. Nobody is going to ask you the abnormalities of the fundus in in this basic sciences. But you will be asked the normal. Even in your theory, that's why I'm mentioning it now. What are the landmarks? The first landmark that you see here, 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 and here is the macula. Macula is the most central. Absolute geometric center of the eye. Geometric center. Approximate eyeball size 24 millimeters. Exactly the posterior pole is the macula. It used to be called macula lutea. Lutea means yellow because the first appearance of the macula was seen in a special type of light which was free from red and therefore it appeared yellow. But nowadays the word lutea is dropped. Nowadays we just say macula. So this is the central part of the eye. Absolute geometric center. What is the appearance of the macula? First, it is brighter red in color than the rest of the retina. Why is it brighter red? Because here, the retina is thin. Therefore, the capillary vessels shine through. So, this is the appearance of the macula. Brighter red. In the center of the macula, you've got an area which is called the fovea centralis, which is the center of the highest visual activity. The center of the macula, absolute center of the macula is called the fovea centralis. Okay. Next landmark. For the eye, we don't use the word medial or lateral. We use the word nasal or temporal. We use the word nasal, that means medial, or temporal means lateral. Please note very carefully. The macula is the absolute geometric center. A little nasal to that, you have the optic disc. You have the optic disc. The optic disc is approximately 2 to 2.5 disc diameters nasal to the macula, or 3 to 4 millimeters nasal to the macula. This is the side which is creamy or yellowish in color. Point number one. Two, it is called a shallow depression, which is referred to as the physiological cup. It is called a shallow depression, which is called the physiological, which occupies less than half the diameter of the disc. Point number three, 
This is the place where all the axons of the ganglion cells converge and form the optic nerve. So this area does not have any rods and cones. Therefore, this is the area of blind spot, the physiological blind spot. Are we clear? Next, it has got fine blood vessels, which are known as the disc vessels. It is not shown here. Next point. The temporal margin of the disc, that is the lateral margin of the disc, is more clearly demarcated than the nasal margin. This is how you will determine which is which eye it is. The temporal margin is more clearly demarcated than the nasal margin. And the final point, from the center of the disc, you will see four pairs of blood vessels emerging. Two superior, two inferior pairs. They are respectively the superior and inferior temporal and nasal retinal artery and retinal veins. So these are all the salient points about the optic disc. Next, the appearance of the retina in general. Sorry, the appearance of the retina in general. Again, it is pale pink in color, but it is lighter than the macula. Why is it pale pink in color? Why is the macula red in color? Again, remember I told you the outer surface of the retina is supplied by the choreal capillary <coughs> plexus. It is the plexus of blood vessels which shines through. That's why when you take pictures of each other, and if the light happens to catch you right in the pupil at that moment of time, do you get the red eye? Can you see the red eye here? I put a picture here. Can you see the red eyes? This has been taken from one of you. I mean, not you. Yeah. <laughs> some, some three matches ago. This is because of the choreocapillary plexus. And it is this which gives the red appearance to the retina and to the macula, the choreocapillaries. That's why nowadays we have the red eye reduction, red eye flash, and all those things. OK. And finally, a few words about the retinal blood vessels. I told you there are four pairs. Two superior, two inferior. How do we distinguish the artery from the vein? The artery is always thinner than the vein. The artery has got a brighter light reflects because of the ophthalmoscopic light, it reflects more. So these are the two important differences between the artery. The artery is thinner than the vein. It has got a brighter light reflex and it is less red than the vein. It appears less red, lighter red than the vein. So these are some important differences. So whichever is the thinner one is the artery, whichever is the thicker one is the vein. Yes, the vein is thicker, arteries are thinner in the retina. So, conducting on the retina, the characteristics of the retina. Okay, so by looking at this, can you tell which eye it is? Hmm? Oh, it's written there. How do you say it's left eye? Suppose that it is not written there. So, always look for the temporal margin. Whichever is the bright, that's more sharply demarcated, that is the temporal side. So, if this is the temporal side, that means this is lateral, right? So, the person is looking at you, this is lateral, so it's the left eye. So, that's how you relate. Another way to determine is, another way to determine which, which, which side is this or which side is this. The temporal blood vessels will be, because remember this is nasal, so the temporal blood vessels will be longer. That's another way to determine. Because optic disc is situated more nasal, so the temporal blood vessels will be more curvy. Temporal blood vessels will be more curvy. That's also another indirect way to determine which side it is. But you will be asked the normal findings. You will not be expected to diagnose any abnormality, and you will be expected to see this during your FCM also. But in the exams also, you'll be asked. That's why I mentioned all these things. Okay. So these are the some points about the retina itself. I told you about the retinal histology, the types of cells, a few quick words about the rods and cones, the retinal physiology, and the fundus appearance. Now let's start with the visual pathway as a whole. And every step of the way, just like you have to know every step of the way of the lateral and the anterior spinothalamic tract, similarly here also, you have to know every step of the way. So let's first give you a quick overview. I'll give you a first overview. It's a four-layer, four-order neuron chain, first point. <coughs> Three of those neurons are already in the retina itself, yes? The layer of rods and cones, the inner nuclear layer, the layer of bipolar cells, the ganglion cells. 
the fourth layer of neuron will be the thalamus. So it's a four neuron chain, first point. So here is the retina, which is already got the three layers we mentioned. And we said that the axons of the ganglion cells constitute the optic nerve. So this is the optic nerve. What are they? They are the nothing but the axons of the ganglion cells. Optic nerve, I'm just first naming the structures, then we will go into the details of each. Optic chiasma, optic tract, optic tract, LGB, sure, okay, lateral geniculate body, thalamus, now you will see the details of LGB, optic radiation, occipital cortex, cuneus gyrus, lingual gyrus, you see the importance why we were hammering on head over cuneus and lingual, cuneus and lingual. They will have lots and lots of clinical significance for us. So there's a full pathway. Now let's take them step by step. There's another picture to show you quickly, just a part of the optic tract and then what happens later on. This gives you a diagrammatic representation right up to the cortex. We will be using this similar picture again and again. Okay, let's start with the optic nerve. We have already seen the optic nerve is formed by the union of all the axons of the ganglion cells. Location of the optic nerve. Location of the optic nerve. It passes through the optic foramen. Where? Here. This is where the optic nerve emerges. So after it passes through the orbit, the optic nerve emerges through the optic foramen. This is an MRI picture to show you the location of the optic nerve inside the orbit. Incidentally, this also picture of location of the left C and six palsy, but we'll not bother about that. I put this picture, this also the location of the optic nerve within the optic, uh, in the orbit. That will be, this is a diagrammatic representation of the same thing. Some special features about the optic nerve. Because it's a central nervous system tract, it has got all the three layers of the dura. I want you to note that point. That means it's got three layers of the meninges, dura, arachnoid, biomater. It has also got a covering of CSF. This is an important point. It has got lots of clinical significance. One of the features of meningitis is optic photophobia. Patient has got difficulty in looking at light. Why? Because these meninges get inflamed and therefore they irritate the optic nerve. Why do you get papilledema? when there's increased intracranial pressure. Now think and answer. It's mentioned in this slide here. Why do you get papilledema when there's increased intracranial pressure? I'm going to talk about it in the clinical part, but I want you to understand why now itself. Because, yes, because the central retinal artery and central retinal vein, they pierce through the layers of dura, they go through the subarachnoid space, they enter the optic nerve, and then they come out on the retinal surface. So when there's increased intracranial pressure, it compresses the central retinal vein first. Yes? Because vein is thin wall. Artery is pumping blood, vein is not draining the blood, so there is edema. Make sense? That is why you get. Similarly, I told you just now, the optic nerve, when it is passing through the optic foramen, here it's a complete metal ophthalmic artery. It is situated very close to the ethmoid and the sphenoid sinuses. And the bone here is very thin. Ethmoidal bone is very thin. So when a person gets ethmoidal or sphenoidal sinusitis, it produces inflammation of the optic nerve, causing infective optic neuritis. I'm using the word infective optic neuritis. Why? Because there is something called demyelinating optic neuritis. You okay? Infective optic neuritis, when there's inflammation of the optic nerve because of ethmoidal or sphenoidal sinusitis, as opposed to demyelinating. Okay. Now I mentioned the compression of the optic nerve produces optic atrophy, and we just now saw Foster Kennedy syndrome. And finally, blood supply, supplied by the central retinal artery. Next structure is optic chiasma. 
location of the optic chiasma. This is the location of the optic chiasma. There's a shadow sulcus. This is called the chiasmatic sulcus. This is where the optic chiasma is located. Important relationships of the optic chiasma. You have to know important relationships. This is a sagittal view to show you. Anteriorly, it is related to the lamina terminalis. Posteriorly, it is related to the infundibulum and the pituitary stalk. I need you to note this relationship down. It's very important. The optic chiasma is located exactly at the junction between the anterior wall and the floor of the third ventricle. Optic chiasma is located at the junction between the floor and the anterior wall of the third ventricle. Optic chiasma has got a small recess of the third ventricle, which is known as the chiasmatic recess. And optic chiasma is bathed by CSF from outside also. This is called the chiasmatic cistern. So optic chiasma is bathed by CSF from inside as well as outside. Chiasmatic recess inside and chiasmatic cistern outside. Laterally, the optic chiasma is related to, please take a good look at this picture because these are all clinically important. Laterally, the optic chiasma is related to a curved portion of the internal carotid artery. And that is called the carotid siphon. The carotid siphon is not shown in this picture. It will be located here. It is shown in that picture. Laterally, the optic chiasma is related to the carotid siphon. Just note these relationships. Anterior lamina terminalis, posterior, infundibulum, the pituitary stalk, laterally, the internal carotid artery. Next, what happens in the optic chiasma? In the optic chiasma, take a good look. Look at the blue and the pink fibers. Very important. 60% of the fibers coming from the optic nerve, they cross in the optic chiasma. Which fibers? The medial fibers, the nasal fibers. Sorry, I should use the word nasal. So take a look at this pale blue here. It is crossing over to the opposite side, yes? Look at the pink here. It is crossing over to the opposite side. Nasal fibers, which must be crossing over 60% of the nasal fibers coming from the optic nerve, they cross over. Temporal fibers remain on the same side. I need you to understand that point. Temporal fibers remain on the same side. Nasal fibers cross. So once they have crossed, I need you to notice something. Look at the color coding. This color coding is not random. It has been done with a purpose. This pale blue is the nasal fibers from the retina, yes? And on this side, he has shown the pink fibers, again the nasal fibers. So this nasal fiber has crossed over to this side, and this nasal fiber has crossed over to this side. So in the optic tract, what happens? The color coding becomes same, yes or no? In the optic tract, the color coding has become same, pink, 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 and blue, blue. This is, it is done with the significance, and I'll tell you what the significance just now. So important point, nasal fibers cross, temporal fibers do not cross. We will see an important clinical correlation because of the arteries which is situated on either side. I told you the carotid siphon. I'll tell you it's written there, but I won't talk about it now. I just want you to know the relationship. Optic tract. Optic tract starts from the posterolateral aspect of the chiasma. Optic tract starts from the posterolateral aspect of the optic chiasma and ends in the lateral genic vein. Types of fibers in each optic tract. Now, please follow me very closely. Each optic tract, again, each optic tract receives fibers from that side retina. Did you understand my point? So, this is the left optic tract, yes? It receives fibers from the left, left retina. Are we clear? I need you to understand this point. Each optic tract receives fibers from that side of retina. I didn't say nasal or temporal. Nasal or temporal, I said that side. So right optic tract 
receives fibers from the right, right retina. Clear? The left optic tract receives fibers from the left, left retina. Are we clear with this much point? So what have you guessed? Each optic tract serves the opposite half of the binocular visual field. Yes or no? This is the most important point to be carried on. Because each optic tract receives fibers from the that half of each retina. Each optic tract receives fibers from that half of each retina. Each optic tract serves the opposite half of the binocular visual field. I need you to get this point absolutely clear because the entire crux of the visual pathway lesions will be dependent on this single point. So this optic tract serves this half and this half of the binocular visual field and vice versa. Did everybody understand this? Who has not understood this? So they, I want this to be absolutely clear. Okay. Some more important relationships of the optic tract. The optic tract, as you can see, this is a cut section of which part of the brain? Can anybody hazard a guess? Uh, which part of the brain? The brain stem. Wonderful. So this is a section of the midbrain, right? So these two things that you see here, these are the crust cerebri, the cerebral peduncles. That is what is shown here in another view here. The optic tract winds around the cerebral peduncle of the midbrain. Yes, you want to ask something? Yeah, about what you said for each optic tract serves to the opposite? Half of the binocular visual field because it receives fibers from that side of retina. I'm going to go into it again just after I finish the pathway. Okay. But right now itself, I want you to be with me and follow what I'm saying. Look at the color coding. Pink, pink, yes? But they're from two different... That's why I use the word from the same half of each retina. Didn't I use that word? Okay. Each optic tract receives fibers from the same half of each retina. What is the meaning of this phrase? The left optic tract receives fibers from the left half of the left eye and the left half of the right eye. Make sense or no? The right optic tract receives fibers from the right half of the right eye and the right half of the left eye. That's what I meant by it receives fibers from the same side of each retina. I spelled it out okay, much more elaborately, but I need you to understand that point. That is the reason why he has given the color coding. Okay, the optic tract then winds around the cerebral peduncle. When it is winding around the cerebral peduncle, take a good look. It is closely related to this artery here, which is called the anterior choroidal artery. It is a branch of the internal carotid. It's the anterior choroidal artery, which is a branch of the internal carotid. And this internal carotid artery, anterior choroidal artery supplies the optic tract. And again, there's a very important clinical correlation, which we shall see later on called Monaco syndrome, but I won't talk about it now. It is related to the anterior choroidal artery. This optic tract, it projects to the lateral genic red body. Optic tract projects to the lateral genic red body. And we will see, and if you remember, when we were talking in block one, we talked of something called transneuronal degeneration. Remember? Can anybody define it for me? What is the meaning of the phrase transneuronal degeneration? Exactly, and I use this example. If I were to do a transaction or some injury to the optic tract, there is transneuronal degeneration of the lateral chain. This is the example I use and it's written there also. Okay, next point. Optic tract, I told you, ends in the lateral geniculate body. It is shown here. Let me use this picture. The optic tract ends in the lateral geniculate body. 90% of the fibers end in the geniculate body. A few percentage of fibers do not go to the lateral geniculate body. They go to four other places. What are those four other places? Can you see this picture here? Some fibers are branching away. Some fibers are branching away from the optic tract. One. Some set of fibers go to the pretectal nucleus. Do we remember the pretectal nucleus? They are situated just, just into the superior colliculus nucleus, in the midbrain. What do they serve? They serve, they serve, they serve the pupillary light reflex. I'm going to tell you the pathway for the light reflex at the end of this chapter. 
second some set of fibers go to the superior follicular cells. What do they serve? The visual body reflex, which also I'm going to tell you in the end of this chapter. Third, some set of fibers go to a special nucleus in the hypothalamus, which we have not seen yet. That is called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And what does it serve? It serves the circadian rhythm, pineal melatonin secretion. Day and light circadian rhythm. And fourth, some set of fibers go to the medial geniculate body in the thalamus. We will see the medial geniculate body in the auditory pathway, and it serves the audiovisual reflex. So you see, the optic tract, some fibers do not go to the lateral geniculate body, they go to four other places. What are they? Prejectile nucleus, or pupillary light, light reflex, superior colliculus for the visual body reflex, suprachiasmatic nucleus for circadian rhythm melatonin, and medial geniculate body for audiovisual reflex. So these set of fibers which are branching away from the optic tract, they are serving various visual reflexes. The reason I put this picture here is to just to remind you, we talked of something called the brachium of the superior colliculus or the superior brachium and brachium of the inferior colliculus, inferior brachium. The fibers which go to the prejectile nucleus and the superior colliculus, they go through the superior brain. They go through the superior brain. And that's why I put this picture here just to remind you and correlate with what we have seen in the brainstem. So this is the optic tract. And finally, the optic uh, lateral geniculate body. This is a picture of the thalamus. You will see the details of thalamus in the chapter at the end of this block. The at the posterior end of the thalamus, do you see this green color here? This is the posterior enlarged end of the thalamus, and I think I did mention it here in the lab session. This posterior end of the thalamus is called the pulvinar of the thalamus. I'm not talking about the thalamus now, I'm just going to give you the relationship. If you look under the pulvinar of the thalamus, you will find two bent swellings. The medial one is called the medial geniculate body, and the lateral one is called the lateral geniculate body. The medial geniculate body is concerned with visual, the auditory pathway. The lateral geniculate body is the place where the optic tract synapses. Why is it called geniculate body? Because I told you, geno means a bend. These structures, they are bent like a knee. That's why they're called geniculate body. This is again another picture to show you the thalamus, and you can see the medial and the lateral geniculate body. Okay, this is the lateral geniculate body. Lateral geniculate body is the place where ninety percent of fibers optic tract. Structure of the lateral geniculate body. Lateral geniculate body is shaped. This whole thing is the lateral geniculate body. Can you see it's curved? This is the ventral part, this is the dorsal part. The lateral geniculate body has got six layers of cells. Numbered from below up, from ventral to dorsal, as layer one, two, three, four, five, six. Layers one and two, they are phylogenetically the older cells, the larger cells. They are called the magnocellular layers. Layers three, four, five, six are phylogenetically recent and more advanced. Both, they are called the parvocellular layers. So you've already guessed something. One and two serve the magnocellular stripe system. Three, four, five, six serve the parvocellular blob system. In between each of these layers of cells, there's a little bit of white matter, which is called the neurofil. Neurofil by definition is the white matter in between gray matter. And these neurofill layers also contain a few scattered smaller cells which are known as the corneocellular layers, but they are not important for us. Most important are the magnocellular and the parvocellular. Layers two, three, and five receive impulses from the same eye. Layers one, four, and six receive impulses from the opposite. Layers two, three, and five receive impulses from the same eye, and one, four, six from the opposite eye. The magnocellular layer and the parvocellular layer, they all project to layer four of the visual cortex. And this projection constitutes what is known as a stria of genari. Go back to the Chapman cortex, you will find me mentioned the stria of genari. The parvocellular blobs layer is responsible for color vision, visual acuity, and pattern recognition. The magnocellular stripe system is concerned with motion, 
depth and spatial perception. I'm repeating again. You don't have to know the details of all the pathways, just know this much, which I told you. So these are a few salient points about the primary, uh, the, the, the lateral geniculate body. Blood supply of the lateral geniculate body, it is supplied by the anterior choroidal artery and the posterior cerebral artery. Lateral geniculate body is supplied by the anterior choroidal artery and the posterior cerebral artery. Okay. I think we will stop now because the optic radiation is a little complicated and I'm going to start to tomorrow.